Christ regularly. We come continuously, not occasionally, not sporadically, not with a commitment that's conditioned by our mood. Now you know how, how difficult it can be if you get out of bed on the wrong side on a Sunday morning and you, you've got a kind of jaundiced look uh, 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 on, on life and, and you, you think not too carefully, uh, am I going to make it to church this morning? Do I, do I feel like coming to church this morning? You know, it's, it's not like that. For if our Lord had gone according to mood or circumstance, he would never have gone to Calvary. It was always with him, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so we come with great regularity and continuously. Those of you who work, would not approach your employment on that occasional basis. So why approach God in the same way? So that's the first point under that heading of what we must do. The second is a question. Which Christ are we to come to? Oh, what a strange question. Which Christ should we come to? Everyone knows which Christ we should come to. Well, don't we all come to the same Christ? That's what people say. But you see, it's a very important question. And on your answer to that question depends the regularity and the consistency of your coming to Him. Because it depends on how you esteem Him as to how much you are attracted to Him. It's not we are not talking about mere duty here. We are talking about the desire of the regenerate heart. We are talking about the, the newborn babe desiring the, the pure milk of God's word. As I said, it's just extending the thought. And what you have to ask yourself, is the Christ that I profess to worship worthy of that kind of commitment, of that regularity and that consistency and that determination and that desire and love? Does he pass the test? Is he the most worthy object of my faith? And I think we'll always have very serious questions to ask about. And when it comes to answering the question, which Christ, what we have to remember is that there have always been two perceptions. And, and that comes up in the passage here when he refers to the Old Testament. There is the Christ of God's perception and then there is the Christ of man's perception. The Christ of God's perception is the living stone. He is living because he is life. He is the one whom God raised from the dead and gave glory to. He is the one who ever lives to make intercession for his people. He is the one whom to know is eternal life. He is the author of life. He was the one who was in, in the beginning with God and was God. All things were made by him and without him was nothing made. He's the living stone. And Peter tells us two things about this living stone. He says, in the sight of God, he is chosen and precious. This is the Christ of God's perception. He is chosen and precious. Chosen. Now Peter is thinking Old Testament here. You know, his theology goes way back. He didn't make it, make it up on the spur of the moment. No, he's drawing on the rich revelation of God in Old Testament times. So in Isaiah 42, verse 1, you have these words. Behold my servant, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. 
He will bring forth justice to the nations. My chosen one. Who is this chosen one? Oh, he's the servant of the Lord. The one who came to do the Lord's will for his people. The one who brought, would, would bring salvation uh, to the Gentiles and bring them into the church as we read in Ephesians chapter 2. And so, the chosen one is actually a, a, a title of the Messiah. And the Jews knew this because according to Luke 23, 35, when they were gathered at the cross and some of the rulers were mocking him, they said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen one of God. Well, he was the chosen one. He is the chosen one of God. So he is God's chosen. But it also says that he's precious. In God's sight, he is precious. This is God's perception of Christ. This Messiah King, this deliverer, this priest, this sacrifice that God gave for the sins of the world is the one in whom God the Father delights. At his baptism, those words were heard. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And again, those words reflect the words of Isaiah 42. Behold my servant, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. God speaking of the Son. And so he's precious. He's God's precious servant Messiah King. He is precious because his blood is precious according to 1 Peter 1.18. We are ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. And he is precious because God has given him honor and glory at the transfiguration and at his ascension. And so you see, he is presented here as the only worthy object of faith. The one who passed the test at every point along the way. He's the desire of the regenerate heart. That's what Peter's saying. Is he the desire of your heart this morning? Or are you right now switched off? Maybe looking at your cell phone or looking at something else or thinking about something else. Whatever it is, I ask you, is he the desire of your heart? Is he the goal of your regenerate life? Is he the one to whom we turn when doubts and tri trials afflict us? Is he the one who's coming? We earnestly wait for the one when who uh, of whom when we think of him we cry out Maranatha Lord come. So that's God's perception of the Christ, the living stone to whom we are to come. But there's another perception that's mentioned here in these these Old Testament uh, citations, and that is the rejected Christ. The rejected Christ. He's rejected by men. The stone that the builders rejected. Psalm 180. The stone that the builder reject, builders rejected. And the word there is a word that, that Peter has already used for the testing of faith. The proving. That is, that it comes out uh, pure and authentic and strong after it's been tried in the fires. Well here, um, Christ seems to uh, uh, come out of the testing very badly and he's failed. He's rejected after men have put him to the test. He, he fails the test of, of, uh, of popular thinking. And so, he becomes a stumbling block to those people. A rock of offense, as it's called. And, and we know that that's the case. That, that Jesus Christ, according to the Apostle Paul, is, is a stumbling block 
He was a stumbling block to his own people, the Jews. The word in Greek actually means a scandal. A scandal. He became a scandal. A scandal. And foolishness to the Greeks. So he failed the popular test. He wasn't recognized. He was rejected. Not the quality that we're looking for. He doesn't come up to expectation. Well, we don't come to that Christ, do we? When Peter says, keep on coming, it's not to that Christ, is it? Of course it is. It's the same Christ. It's the same Christ. He's the same one. And what you have to ask yourself this morning is, which perception of him do you have? He's the same Christ. He is the living stone, and if you are a living stone, if you have been born again, then you will naturally gravitate to the living stone. Because he is the wisdom of God, he's the power of God, he's the righteousness of God, he's redemption from God, he's sanctification from God. He's all of those things to those who believe. And that's why, why Peter says there is honor for those who believe in, in verse 7. There is an honor for those who believe. And it's, it's to be found in him and it's to be found connected to him in that building. So that you as a living stone are connected to him, the living stone. And you're integrated into this spiritual house. So come to him. If you've never come to him, not really, and you'll know in your heart if, you, if you're a real believer. But I want, to, I want to invite you this morning, very briefly, to come to Christ. Come in all your need. Come in all the degradation of your sin. Come with your guilty conscience. Come with the insecurity and the strife and the hostility generated by sin in our life. Come with it. Because I can tell you that there's plentiful grace in Him. Grace to cover all our sin. Please come.